president wants to spy on 200 million Americans without a warrant. Has he read this document which he was sworn to uphold? Now, I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. When we do have secret prisons, that is not what America's all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Good evening, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Today is September 11th, 2011. And it would seem trite for me to tell you what happened 10 years ago, because every American, indeed virtually every one of the world, knows what happened 10 years ago. Any adult, anyone who was eight years old, 10 years ago or older, knows exactly what happened on September 11th, 2001. I remember my parents telling me that everyone knew where they were on November 22nd, 1963, the day John F. Kennedy was shot. My grandparents told me everyone knew where they were on December 7th, 1941, the day of Pearl Harbor. Certainly you and I and everyone listening to my voice over a certain age remembers where they were 10 years ago. Tonight I want to explore not just what I did, not just what you did, and you're welcome to call in 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275 and share your personal remembrances of 10 years ago. I want to focus not just on what happened, but on how I felt during that time, how you felt during that time, and how our feelings changed regarding our country, regarding our world. Ten years later, it is easier to look back with some hindsight to see what lessons we learned. How did America change for the better or for worse? And what can we learn from all of this? I think it's important not just to look back 10 years, but to look forward 10 years, to ask where we will be 10 years from now. It seems to me that with the Arab Spring, that somewhat spontaneous uprising of peoples all over the Arab world against their government, the people who started September 11th are almost, if not completely, already consigned to the dustbin of history. Al-Qaeda is much weaker than it was 10 years ago, but there are new battles to be fought. How is it that we got from here to there? And what does it mean for American civil liberties? What does it mean for the American view of ourselves? How have we changed since September 11th, 2001? Let's start with remembrance of that day. Disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. The CNN Center right now is just beginning to work on this story, obviously calling our sources and trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something relatively devastating happening this morning there. The clearly something's going on. But we're not sure what it is. I remember very clearly that morning. I was working in Washington at that time. I was legislative counsel to Congressman Barney Frank. Most of the things I had to work on had to do with House Judiciary matters. Indeed, although I would later work on the House Committee overseeing Homeland Security, that committee didn't exist on September 11, 2001. Indeed, even the name Homeland Security would have sounded very strange in our ears that bright, beautiful morning, Tuesday. September 11. I had come to Washington because of something completely unrelated to foreign terrorism, something completely domestic, the United States Supreme Court decision of Bush v. Gore. I had been a trial lawyer in California, in fact, and I had been working uh, on ordinary cases, doing very well, actually. And when I learned that election night that Al Gore had won the state of Florida, had won the national election, I was quite pleased, no question about it. But when a few months later, the United States Supreme Court overturned the election and installed by fiat the guy that lost the election, George W. Bush, I, like most Americans, was pretty upset. 
You know, before September 11th, it's kind of hard to remember how upset Americans were by the United States Supreme Court overturning an election, refusing to let the people of Florida count their votes, refusing to allow Florida's electoral votes go to the winner of that state, and instead installing George W. Bush as president. That kind of installation of a president outside of democratic norms hadn't happened in the United States of America since 1877, and no one was alive to remember that day. Polls showed that 63% of Americans believed that the president chosen by the Supreme Court was illegitimate, and that the president chosen by the people through the Electoral College, that was the one, Al Gore, who should be our president. So I came to Washington that day. I uh, went and I uh, wrote, in fact, a brief challenging the Florida electors. I went to January 2001 to my first protest against the legitimacy of the American government. I had never done that before. I had disagreed with various American policies, but I never once protested the legitimacy of our government. But of course, that government being chosen by five lawless individuals against the will of the American people, I felt I had to do that. And I was very proud of the fact that there were two to three times the number of people protesting in January 2001, the people who were supporting that president. I mention all of that because it's important to understand the mindset going into September 11th. George Bush already, a few months into office, had an approval rating in the low 40s. The majority of Americans, as I said, considered his presidency illegitimate. He was floundering fast. So that morning, I went, I woke up, I was in the parking garage below the Rayburn House office building, and one of my colleagues that I work with saw me in the parking lot as we were going upstairs and say, did you hear about the plane that hit the World Trade Center? I said, what? He said, yes, some, some plane hit the World Trade Center. I said, no, let's go upstairs and watch it on TV. I said, what happened? Did the plane have mechanical trouble? He said, I don't know. Let's go see what's going on. And so we turned on the television, we went upstairs, we saw the North Tower in flames, just like you've seen on the CNN clip. And we went to tell our boss what had happened. Now, five minutes after that, we turned back on the set, and the second tower had been hit. We, I actually saw, as many of you did, saw the second plane hit the second tower and I knew immediately we were at war. I immediately thought back to Pearl Harbor. Being somewhat of a student of history, I thought that's how it must have felt December 7th, 1941, when there was a surprise attack, and we immediately went from peacetime to war. At that time, all my questions about George Bush's legitimacy to be president, they were secondary. I knew that he hadn't been elected, but at the same time, I also knew that someone had to protect us, that someone was attacking us. Didn't know who, I had my suspicions, but I didn't know who, I didn't know why. My colleague, in fact, was probably more perceptive, not probably, he was, he was more perceptive than I was. After the second plane hit the second tower, he very quickly said, I'm out of here. And he ran out and I guess took a car and went home. Me, I stayed around a little while. I was trying to figure out what was going on. I was trying to figure out whether or not and how we would go to war. In fact, at that time, I supported a formal declaration of war. I pulled out my Constitution of the United States and said, that's the way it works. That's what happened after Pearl Harbor. That's the right way to do it. Have the presidents convene Congress and have a formal declaration of war. Because this was self-defense. This wasn't a voluntary war. This wasn't a war of choice. We were being attacked. People were dying. I know that you remember, the way I remember, watching the news that day, seeing the World Trade Center in flames, watching very carefully. You couldn't really see their faces, but actually seeing people fling off the tower, flying to their deaths. I remember thinking they need to get helicopters up on top to save the people on top of the building. Next, we heard the Pentagon had been hit. The Pentagon? It's not just New York. It's the Washington area as well. Just across the river from where we were. Now things were getting very scary. Indeed, 
Then we heard the State Department had been hit. That rumor turned out to be false. But it was all around us. And then I watched, as you watched, as we all watched, sickeningly, as the first tower, actually the second tower hit, the South Tower, collapsed to the ground. It was unbelievable. We were in denial. You saw the building pancake one floor on top of the other. No one expected that to happen. The Empire State Building had been hit by a small plane in 1948 and it killed a few people. But the whole tower didn't collapse. Well, in some ways the buildings made in the 1930s were stronger than the buildings made in the 1970s. And of course, a small plane doesn't have the same impact as a large jet plane. You could hear the screams. You could see the people run. What started as a tragedy, what started as a terrorist attack, became incomprehensible. You knew that thousands had gotten out, but you also knew that thousands were in the building. Thousands of innocent people, people living their lives, going to work, and hundreds of firefighters and police officers, people who ran in the building while others ran out the true heroes of that day. It was sickening. It was incomprehensible. And you knew that the second tower, if the first tower did this, if it could structurally handle the airplane, surely the second tower would collapse as well. Now, it was really scary. What to do? What to do? Suddenly, we heard a knock knock on the door of uh, our office. The people from next door, from Martin Frost's office, uh, Democrat of Texas, the staffer knocked on the door and said, hey, the Republicans have fled the building. The Republicans have fled the building. He was going and knocking on all the door of the Democratic offices. Apparently, all the Republican offices were deserted. They had all fled like my colleague. There was no alarm bell. There was no intercom used by the Capitol Police. From whatever method the Republicans had decided to flee, and they hadn't told us, their fellow Americans from a different political party. So this staffer was going door to door to the offices that were still occupied, Democratic offices, telling us to get out. When we come back, I will continue with my personal story and then move on to some reflections. What we've learned from September 11th, what happened afterwards, how it changed our country in ways that, well, may never change back. If you want to call in and share your, what you felt, 888-488-MARK. Too many women get hit by their boyfriends and husbands. Too many women are pressured into having unprotected sex. Half of the people in the world living with AIDS are women. It doesn't matter. What is on the sidewalk? Together, we can change this reality. Let's strive for a world free of violence. At Volunteers of America, we don't just give kids a way to stay off the streets, we give them the tools they need to reach their full potential. We don't just help the elderly receive needed care. We help them live life to the fullest. We don't just provide food for homeless individuals and families. We provide job training and placements so they can buy groceries. Volunteers of America is a national organization that for over a hundred years has provided programs and services that allow people to overcome their challenges to become vital members of their community. At Volunteers of America, we don't just help people, we help people help themselves. Find out how you can support the programs that are working in your community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Guys, 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 stop, stop playing, no? I'm 127 seconds. Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. Drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. 
In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. We're reviewing what happened 10 years ago, what happened afterwards, what we learned from it, and where we are going to go 10 years from now. I want to play some disturbing footage, stuff that we all saw 10 years ago, but it's worthwhile to remember the panic and the horror of that day. So at the ash, the crumbled concrete that is continuing to rain down after one of the two towers of the World Trade Center, the upper floors collapsed. This after this apparent terrorist attack this morning that sent a, a large jetliner, perhaps two large jetliners, slamming into the Twin Towers. Come over this way, Pat. You can see the chaos. We can see the top of the building from here. Oh, yeah. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. There it goes. There it goes. Oh, when it comes down, we're... All right. We do need to put it down now. I think we need to put it down now. Here we go. Unimaginable, really. I watched the first tower fall. By the time the second tower fell, I was in my car. I was actually uh, under a bridge in Washington, D.C. They had closed the bridges down. I don't really blame the authorities. They didn't know what to do. And I remember every time I passed that spot in Washington, D.C., I know exactly where I was on September 11th with a work colleague of mine as we listened to the radio and waited for hours under that bridge until the bridges back to Virginia were open. It was surrealistic. We knew we were under attack. We didn't know who at the earliest moment had done it, but we knew it was war. We knew it would be self-defense. And I, who, as I have said, did not believe that our president was chosen legitimacy. legitimately. After all, the Constitution says you you got to go with the people who, the Electoral College chosen by the winner of the states, and Al Gore got the most votes in Florida. At that time, they just didn't count the votes. But knowing that Bush was not our elected president didn't change the fact that I wanted him to do something about it. They showed him, they showed George Bush in Florida reading a book called The Pet Goat to a bunch of school children. He's reading the book. And a guy, I think Andrew Card, his chief of staff, whispers in his ear. And I expected him to say, children, I've got to run. The presidency requires me to do various things. Instead, he kept reading that stupid little book for seven, eight minutes. I was surprised. I thought the president surely would get up. And eight minutes later, he finally did. I also remember that day, hours and hours and hours, when I got home watching it on television, wondering when we'd hear from the President of the United States. Do you remember? September 11, 2001? When was the President going to come on air and reassure us Americans that it was all going to be okay, that he was working to get anything under control? I didn't need a full speech. A few sentences would do. President Bush was nowhere to be found. We later found uh, that he had been... Uh, picked up on a plane in Florida and I think uh, hovering around Nebraska somewhere. Couldn't have given us a little speech. Still, all of that was put aside that evening. Members of Congress came back to the Capitol, bravely standing on the White House, on the steps, singing God Bless America. I say bravely because another plane may well have been attended for the Capitol that day plane that we don't know whether it was going to hit the White House or the Capitol, but was downed by some brave, very brave, American heroes over Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Flight 93 would not reach its intended destination because Americans, knowing they would die, decided they would not allow the terrorists to kill others. Todd Beamer's famous statement, let's roll 
became the uh, moniker of the day. Let's roll. Let's go. Let's get those terrorists. I will never forget driving home past the smoldering Pentagon, seeing the flames, seeing the smoke, wondering what my world had become. I'd only been there in Washington six, seven months. I knew things would change. And change they did. Coming back to Congress, working there, the Bush administration wanted a number of things, things that the administration had wanted, powers they had wanted for decades before. The power to surveil Americans without a warrant. The power to reach in and discover all our personal thoughts, to read uh, what we're looking at on the internet, to basically put hundreds of millions of Americans under surveillance. I gotta say proudly that Democrats and Republicans worked together to oppose giving up all our civil liberties. They recognized that even in the horror of war, and I, I knew it was war, again, I wanted a formal declaration of war, that they couldn't give up all of our civil liberties to the public. We worked for three weeks, we in the House Judiciary Committee, Democrats and Republicans worked together. We crafted the, what was then called the USA Patriot Act. And at the time, we actually managed to find a bill they gave the administration some important things they needed. They needed, for example, to have the CIA and the FBI talk to each other. They needed to break down walls so we could find terrorist attacks. We later learned, in fact, that there were untranslated documents in Arabic talking about attack on September 11th that the government apparently didn't read in time. We didn't have enough Arabic translators. You may recall at that time some of our best Arabic translators were fired because they were gay. We also had people like Colleen Rowley in the FBI putting to her superiors, hey, there's this guy in Florida, a guy who wants to, uh, he went to flight school, a person of uh, Arab descent, not an American citizen. He went to flight school and he didn't want to learn how to take a plane off, take off a plane or land a plane. He just wanted to know how to direct a plane in the air. That's mighty suspicious, she said. Her FBI handlers told her, hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. An FBI that back in 2001 was more concerned with not trying to rock the boat than actually catching terrorists. And guess what? We're going to talk a little bit later on about a new discovery, about a new inside scoop, about what the FBI covered up on September 11th that's just coming to light as of today. We'll get to that in a minute. The point was is that we worked, Democrats and Republicans, we worked together. We understood the nation was under attack, that we had to work quickly, but we weren't going to throw away our constitutional values. And we crafted something I'm very proud of, a law that both protected civil liberties and yet gave our government the tools they needed to ferret out a terrorist attack. At the time of the House Judiciary Committee, the bill was passed unanimously. Everyone from Maxine Waters on the far left to Lamar Smith on the far right. Everyone from the people who impeached Bill Clinton to some of the most progressive liberal members of Congress agreed unanimously on this bill. After the law was passed, the members of Congress and we staff all stood up and gave ourselves a standing ovation. We knew we'd done something unique in American history. We had crossed partisan lines to craft a document that would serve Amer the American people well. The next day, that document was thrown in the trash. You see, George Bush's uh, Attorney General, John Ashcroft, thought that the bill protected American civil liberties too much. It insisted that we go by the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution to get warrants, and that if you get a warrant outside the Fourth Amendment, you still needed a court to approve it. He didn't think that was enough. He took our bipartisan bill and he threw it in the trash and gave everybody an hour to read the bill that he wrote, the bill that actually became the USA Patriot Act. That's something that very few people know about. And yet, to me, it spelled a dark warning as to how the Republican Party would use September 11th. At a time when George Bush's approval rating went up to the 90s, 
instead of coming together the way we did in Congress to work on bills we could all agree on to protect the country, to protect American civil liberties, the Republicans decided this crisis is our opportunity. Karl Rove said we can use September 11th to give a massive tax cut to rich people. And he worked hard on doing that. We can use September 11th to torture people. Even though torture is prohibited by the Eighth Amendment, we can torture people. We can send people to secret prisons. Years later, we would learn that hundreds of millions of Americans, you and me, at least two-thirds of American citizens, were spied on by our government without a warrant. Even though the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution says very clearly that you have a right to be secure in your person's houses, papers, and effects, and that right to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, in other words, you need a court order. It's fine to spy on the terrorists, but it's not fine to spy on ordinary American citizens. For others, of course, it was much worse. Our government, the United States government, picked up people, innocent people, picked them up in scores, sent them away to secret prisons in foreign countries to be tortured. Now, I was aware that America could overreact in a time of war. One of my favorite presidents, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was behind the plan to put hundreds of thousands of Americans in camps, Japanese Americans. While we had every right and duty to respond to Pearl Harbor, to fight back against Imperial Japan, those Japanese Americans hadn't done anything wrong. There was no indication that they had done anything wrong. They were merely interned because they were of Japanese descent. Well, we kind of did the same thing. We tortured innocent people. We sent them to secret prisons. We even tortured guilty people, thinking that that torture would save us, would not cause America itself to be looked down upon. And in doing so, we changed the way the world looked at America after September 11th. On September 12th, 2001, even the French, Le Monde newspaper, said we are all Americans now. All over the world, people expressed their sympathy. People understood that America was going to respond. But in the next few years, with torture, and secret prisons, and surveillance against the Constitution, the Bush administration took this opportunity of September 11th to turn direct to turn America more in the direction of a police state. A lot of the world's support for us went by the wayside. Next up would be the war in Iraq. Art, a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact C. Fripp at AOL.com. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. 
and may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service Here message again. from the Vision Inside Council of America Ridge and reading is fundamental. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop, the 10 year anniversary of September 11th. I want to show you a bit more footage from that day. As you know, John, this has been the nightmare scenario for uh, security experts in Washington, that uh, many of the buildings in Washington, very visible from the air, are very vulnerable. In fact, the flight path to National Airport runs literally six blocks from the White House. So this has always been a big concern. But again, to repeat the information that I have here, Capitol Police have completely evacuated the grounds of the Capitol, and they have told us, quote, there is a plane that's been hijacked. It is south of Washington, headed this way. Uh, now, the reliability of the information I cannot give you, but that's what police have told us. All right, Brian Wilson, thank you, and uh, let us know if you come up with any new information. It is, it is hard to describe, folks. The, the pictures show what has happened in lower Manhattan, but we don't have a handle yet on the devastation. I, I remind you again that there are perhaps 50,000 people who work in the World Trade Centers. Uh, the two towers and and those towers are virtually gone now after this apparent terrorist strike earlier this morning mm -hmm. how many of those fifty thousand people they were able to get out we don't yet know that is the well we know now uh, most were able to get out i remember seeing them streaming out and hoping that they would get out as soon as possible but uh, some three thousand did not get out almost three thousand 184 at the Pentagon, some 40 dead in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and more than 2,700 dead at the World Trade Center. After September 11th, we had a war in Afghanistan. A war, I have to say, that virtually all of us supported. When it came time to fight that war, to do that resolution, they got 100 senators to vote for it and 434 members of Congress, only one, Barbara Lee, voted against it. America was united. We had to get Al-Qaeda, whoever they were, these people that had murdered 3,000 Americans. So we went to war in Afghanistan. We didn't get Osama bin Laden. He got away at Tora Bora. Uh, that's another fortunate failure of, uh, well, I guess the power rests at the top of George Bush. In fact, if you listen to CIA operative Gary Bernstein, he will tell you that they just needed 800 more men, that he asked for that aid, and that aid was denied. So the mastermind of September 11th would get away only to finally be taken out just this year. But we did support the war in Afghanistan. We recognized it was a noble cause. We recognized that the Taliban had aided al-Qaeda and that those terrorist training camps were in Afghanistan. And it was from there that the attack had been launched. And yet there were parts of the attack that weren't focused on very much. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers were not Afghani. They were Saudi Arabian. The other four were Egyptian. And indeed, soon after the attack, the White House gave specific permission to a number of Saudi nationals to flee the country. That was weird. You may remember there was a no-fly zone across the entire United States. People that were flying in from Europe had their planes go down, land in Newfoundland, Canada, and live there for several days while they waited for the people to be able to fly again. And yet at a time when no one was in the skies except Air Force jets, our administration, the Bush administration, our government, was allowing a number of Saudi nationals to escape. Later on in this broadcast, I'm going to show you an article related to this that's even more scary about who escaped September 11th. I'll get to that in a minute. Meanwhile, just after we toppled the Taliban, the Bush administration went back to a plan that they had created on January 30th, 2001. Months before September 11th, they dusted off the plan. This is the plan talked about uh, in uh, The Price of Loyalty by uh, Paul Susskind, where we had the Treasury Secretary report that the administration had dusted off a plan to invade Iraq and divide it up into 12 separate oil fields. Now we were going to attack Iraq. And the American people 
worried about September 11th, most of them went along. Even though the administration never could find a justification. It was like, the Arab has attacked us, let's go attack an Arab country. Saddam Hussein's a bad guy, and he has weapons of mass destruction. No, most Americans believed that lie. We were upset. Most Americans supported the war in Iraq. And so, while letting Osama bin Laden go, we sent hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops off to fight against Saddam Hussein. The people of Iraq weren't uprising. But we were going to take out Iraq. Why? Well, because we were attacked on September 11th. I don't know. It's kind of like if your big brother hits you and then you go and you hit your little brother. You're angry. You've got to strike someone. That war would eventually cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Mostly Iraqi lives but thousands of American lives and tens of thousands of wounded. So here we come to today. Ten years later. We have a new president, President Obama, one elected by the American people. Like him or not, at least he was legitimately elected. And President Obama ran for election saying he would dismantle a lot of the things that George Bush did. The torture, the secret prisons, the warrantless surveillance. He would close the illegal prison in Guantanamo Bay. The prison set up outside the United States, but under land that we leased, because George Bush argued that there we'd be in complete control, but outside the limits of the Constitution. See, it was all, you understand, a, a loophole. Guantanamo Bay. We control it, we own it forever, but the Constitution doesn't apply. We can torture whomever we like. Well, Guantanamo Bay is still open, even though President Obama promised to close it. He's got difficulties, to be sure. There are people there who no doubt are guilty, but because we tortured them under our laws, under the Constitution, we can't use evidence obtained by torture as evidence. So Bush's illegal behavior has put Obama in a bind. We can either release the bad guy or put them on trial, recognizing under our law the evidence we obtain by torture can't be used to convict them. Admittedly, it's not easy. And most Americans, apart from today, have moved on from September 11th. We've got a lousy economy. We need to focus on that lousy economy. President Obama has removed most of our troops from Iraq. He's in the process of removing them from Afghanistan. He has taken out Osama bin Laden from Pakistan. And yet there are still problems. Pakistan, indeed, is what's left of a hotbed of Al-Qaeda, but there's also Yemen. Frankly, there's other terrorism in the world. Iran, probably the greatest terrorist state right now. It's on the way to obtaining nuclear weapons. Funding. Syria, President Assad, who's busy killing his, his people. Funding terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas. There's still terror in the world. And yet Al-Qaeda seems almost defeated. Totally apart from the mistakes of George Bush, totally apart from the mistakes of President Obama or successes, but in keeping what George Bush has done, what have we learned about the enemy? What have we learned about the people that murdered 3,000 Americans? Who were they? What were they up to? I think if you look at where that came from, there's already a huge argument that's occurred over the last 10 years. Certainly they were believing Muslims, and some on the right have said, therefore, all of Islam is bad. Bill O'Reilly famously said, Muslims killed us on 9-11, as if the activities of these 19 evil individuals could be attributed to all the Muslims in the world. Well, we know the vast majority of Muslims are not terrorists. We can't characterize a billion people that way. We know that the vast majority of American Muslims, in fact, just want to be part of this country, just want to assimilate, have come here for the same reasons that my great-grandparents and your great-grandparents, and uh, if, if, they, if your great-grandparents, other than the slaves that we brought here, the vast majority of Americans are immigrants. There are a few descendants of Native Americans, some descendants of slaves. 
But most of us came to America, our ancestors, to seek a better life. And the American Muslims did so as well. Islam, like Christianity, is a world religion. It's complex. It's got various divided thoughts. It's got Shia and Sunni. It's got people fighting each other. Indeed, if you look at the battles between Shia and Sunni Islam and the battles between Islam and Christians and Jews, they're not so different from the battles within Christianity 300, 400, 500 years ago. Indeed, in in Ireland as recently as 20 or 30 years ago, battles between Protestants and Christians or the Crusaders, the Christians who, who attacked and murdered so many Jews and Muslims. Islam is a complex religion. And it's as wrong to say that all Muslims killed us on September 11th as it is wrong to deny the fact that the people who killed us on September 11th were influenced by a religious ideology. Right? Some on the right want to blame all of Islam. That's clearly wrong. And yet some on the left want to ignore any connection to Islam. I think that's wrong too. It's not so much about Islam, I would say, as about a certain radical Islamic fundamentalist theology. One that has achieved a lot of support, or at least did, ten years ago, by suffering peoples, mostly in the Arab world. Of course, there's Muslims in India and Indonesia. Uh, they're not the ones so much that are involved in these kinds of terrorist acts. Why would Muslims in the Arab world be so upset? Well, Americans maybe didn't understand that 10 years ago. I don't know that we understood that two years ago. But in January of this year, 2011, a fruit vendor in Tunisia set himself on fire. And in doing so, brought more attention to the problems of the Arab world than has been brought probably in all the decades of Arab history, of modern Arab history. All the dictators in Tunisia and in Egypt and in Libya and in Syria and in Yemen and in Bahrain. Saudi Arabia, Algeria, the list goes on and on. But the heart of it is that throughout the Arab world were a bunch of dictators in charge. They were corrupt. They mistreated their own people. And so now we have seen a revolution, what we call the Arab Spring. It is successful in Egypt and Tunisia. It's going to be successful in Libya. Successful in the sense of getting rid of the dictators. Where it will be 10 years from now? I don't know. Just this week, the crowds in Egypt, having overthrown their dictator Mubarak, attacked the Israeli embassy. These are the people who aren't seeking a kind of liberal freedom, but actually seeking an enemy. How does this relate to Al-Qaeda? How does this relate to the people who attacked the United States? How do we know whether the Arab Spring is going to lead us in a liberal direction towards democracy, much like the former communist countries underwent 20 years ago? How much of this is a danger likely to lead to a terrorist state like the state of Iran? We'll get to that when I come back. You want to call in? It's 888-48-MARK. 888-48-6275. We'll be back after this. One day these rats will play in the woods. One of some matches and that's no good. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution.
Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. Here again, the inside scoop. With Saving for retirement might be... Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. It is 10 years after September 11th, 2001. And I want to focus on not just what we've learned in the past 10 years, but where the world is going. What will happen in the next 10 years? And to do that, we have to understand the people who attacked us. It's not enough to say that they're evil or they're wrong. Of course they're evil. Of course they're wrong. They murdered 3,000 innocent people. But to merely dismiss them as evil or haters of our freedom, I think is to do America an injustice. The best way to fight evil is to understand that evil, to understand where it comes from, where it's going. Al-Qaeda exists because the Arab world lives under dictatorship. Much as the former Soviet Union and the former Eastern Bloc countries lived under dictatorship. And when you live under dictatorship, when you live under corruption, people get angry. And I don't know that Americans understood the deep-seated resentment in the Arab world towards their own leaders until this year, until the Arab Spring, until a fruit vendor in Tunisia set himself on fire, changed the whole Arab world. But we do know there was anger in the Arab world. We know that the people in the Arab world hated their, their leaders and rose up to fight them. And Al-Qaeda reflected that resentment. Afghanistan was a mess. It was a mess. After all, Afghanistan had been invaded by the Soviet Union. America sent in uh, a number of, of, of aid, a lot of aid and fighters, the Mujahideen, who were fighting against the Soviet Union. And Afghanistan was a mess, warlords fighting other warlords. And people who supported Al-Qaeda just wanted someone strong to end the violence. That's why there was support in Afghanistan for Al-Qaeda. But the issue is broader. I think you'll find that almost any time you find an oppressive dictatorship, the populace splits down into three people, three groups of people. Under the former Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries, there were the people that supported the communist governments and were part of the corruption and were aided by those dictatorships. That tends to be the minority. There are the people that want to fan the old ethnic hatreds. We saw a lot of that in Serbia. There are always ethnic hatreds. There's always reason for people of one group to hate another group. And in fact, you found the communist leaders said, we're in charge to prevent people from killing each other. Right? Tito in Yugoslavia could very truthfully say, if I weren't here, you'd have Serbians killing Kosovars. You'd have Croatians and Bosnians at each other's throat. So there's the people in charge, the people who support the ethnic hatred, and a third group, sometimes the smallest group, the liberals, the people who support liberal democracy, the people who believe in a real democratic state where everyone gets a voice. After the fall of the Soviet Union, we saw the liberals succeed in the Czech Republic quite well. And in Poland, in fact, the Czech Republic and Poland today are members of NATO's and NATO and very strong, prosperous states. Very, they've come a long way in the last 20 years. In Russia, the old communists won. The same is true in Belarus. The dictators took power. And you'll find that in Serbia, the ethnic hatreds won. And people started killing everyone. The same is true in the Arab world. All you have to do is look at Egypt or Libya or Syria. What do you find? You find the people who support the old order, the people who support Gaddafi or support Mubarak or support Assad today, the people who make a lot of money from the corruption of the regimes, and the people who are willing to mow down thousands of innocent people. Only hundreds died in Egypt and Tunisia, but thousands have already died in Syria. Thousands have died in Libya as the 
dictators cling to power. But you also find in the Arab world a third group, right? You find the people who support the dictators. You find the liberal Democrats who are uprising, the Facebook revolution, the young people in the streets who want a democracy, who want a better life. And there is a third group, the group that promotes ethnic hatred, the people who invaded the Israeli embassy, the people who supported al-Qaeda. These are people who, instead of trying to, recognizing that the dictators are the problem in their world, are so angry that they want to go up against traditional enemies. Let's attack the Jews. Let's attack the Christians. Let's have Shia and Sunni attack each other. And the ethnic hatreds today is probably best represented by, the, well, the Islamic Brotherhood in Egypt. That's a Sunni group. Or by Al-Qaeda, which is a Sunni group. Iran represents it in the Shia world. Their government represents the ethnic hatreds. Who will win in the Arab world? Well, the wonderful thing, and there is good news out there, is that because of September 11th, because of our fight against Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda has been in the decline. And it's in the decline not necessarily for military reasons. Sure, that's part of it. Sure, we have managed to beat back Al-Qaeda. Sure, Osama bin Laden is dead. But it's not just the power that's gone. It's the ideas that are diminishing. When you look at the Arab Spring, it wasn't Al-Qaeda that fomented that revolution. It was a fruit vendor in Tunisia. It wasn't Al-Qaeda that sent people out to the streets of Egypt. It was ordinary people fighting for liberal democracy. So in the three sides of the Arab world, the corrupt dictators, the ethnic hatred, and the liberal democrats, I'm happy to report that as of now, the liberal democrats are on the upswing. The people who actually support democracy. Now, again, it's fraught. As I mentioned just last week, those that support ethnic hatred in Egypt are on the ascendance. I don't know what's going to happen in Libya. Perhaps Tunisia is the best example to become like the Czech Republic, to have the liberal democracies succeed. In Syria, so far, it appears that the evil dictators are succeeding, as in Iran. Iran is particularly dangerous. Iran is on the verge of becoming a nuclear state. We've talked about it was going to happen years and years. President Obama said it wasn't going to happen. It's not only going to happen, it's about to happen. And I hope that we or Israel or someone bombs the heck out of that nuclear plant before it happens. Because it could happen in a matter of weeks. It could definitely happen in a matter of months. There's a green revolution in Iran as well. The people of Iran want their freedom just as they do in Syria, just as they do in Tunisia, just as they do in Libya and Egypt and Bahrain and Yemen. And they have been mowed down. So who's going to win this battle? I don't know. But one thing we do know, one thing we did learn from September 11th, is that the terrorists did not succeed. The idea that killing thousands of people is the way out not only turned America against Al-Qaeda, but the dictator Assad killing thousands in Syria has turned Syrians against him. The murder of thousands can never be the way out of a crisis. And so, after September 11th, the, we have to learn the best way to fight against the people that killed 3,000 Americans. Who is the enemy? The enemy is that ethnic hatred, right? The, the, the ones, the people, you can call them extremist, Islamic, whatever you want to call them. They're the people in the Muslim religion who believe they're against the dictators, but they're also against liberal democracy. They are the enemy. And I'm proud to say that as of now, they are beaten down. So how do we win? How do we destroy them? How do we fight like we fought the great battles against communism and fascism? How do we win the war on terror? I'll give you a hint. It's not the way George Bush did it. It's not through torture. It's not through giving up American values. It's not through warrantless surveillance. It's not through sending people to secret prisons. It's not through avoiding the rule of law. No, in doing that, we show ourselves to be no better than the same dictators that the people are fighting against. In fact, some of the people we tortured were sent to Syria, the very country that is torturing and murdering its citizens today. No, the way out is not through the dictatorships. And the way out is certainly not through the Al-Qaeda ethnic hatreds 
the people who just want to kill all the Jews or kill all the Shia or the Sunni or kill all the Americans. That's clearly not the way out. That's clearly our enemy. But the dictators are our enemy as well. The solution is in the third group. The liberal Democrats. The liberal Muslims. The ones who are taking back their countries right and left, sometimes peacefully, sometimes with our help, as in Libya. They are the solution. Because I think you'll find that when we invaded Iraq and took out a hated dictator, Saddam Hussein, we didn't win many friends in the Arab world. We didn't many, win many friends in the entire world. The people of Iraq were not rising up at that time. They were in 91. There it made sense. But the people of Iraq were not rising up. And so the fact that we went in and we occupied Iraq and we fought, not in self-defense, not in defense of the people of Iraq, but for our own national interest for oil, that wasn't looked upon. That was not the right answer. Torture is not the right answer. War and surveillance is not the right answer. There are limits to what we can do with our military. And that's not to in any way denigrate the brave men and women who are, of America who are giving up their lives and fighting hard when 99% of us are barely noticing the effort. Right? George Bush wouldn't even raise taxes to pay for this war. The first war in history, by the way, that wasn't paid for by taxes. He asked the military to sacrifice and no one else. He also, by the way, didn't manage to aid the first responders, the police officers, the firefighters, those heroes who ran into the buildings when all, all the others ran out. When it came to health benefits, when it came to making sure these people who took care of us would be covered, the Republicans cruelly, to this day, refused to allow the people who were so harmed by the breathing in that dust, by allowing them to get the needed medical aid that they need. It's disgusting and it should change. And I hope that you will work on calling your representative in Congress and asking them to make sure our first responders are taken care of. By the end of the day, it's not America that can solve this problem. We can fight against Al-Qaeda. We have. But they're all, there are people who support these ethnic hatreds all over the world. Right? It's, even when we occupy Iraq and Afghanistan, you, all you have to do is look at Pakistan and Yemen and what just happened in Egypt last week. At the end of the day, there will be only one solution to this problem. And that's for the liberal Muslims, the liberal Democrats, the people of the Arab Spring to take this revolution and to take over. Now, we have helped them in Libya. We were a little late in Egypt and Tunisia, but finally we are supportive. We have been very late in Syria. We need to be more supportive in Syria. Because at the end of the day, the only way for the Arab people to take back their liberty, to take back their country, and to do so with peace and freedom and democracy is for them to take it back themselves. And that, I think, is the lesson of September 11th. And we will succeed 10 years from now. The world will succeed and be a more peaceful place 10 years from now. If the Arab Spring succeeds, and if we support those liberal Democrats, they are the key to ending the horrors of September 11th. Hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Check out my website, marklevine.tv.